Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Dr. Raphael Zachman. Raphael earned his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Freiburg, where he carried out research in the groups of professors Reinhard Bruckner and Bernard Bright. During his master's, he also had the chance to work as a visiting research scientist at the University of Manchester and the Proctor Group. He subsequently earned his PhD in the Firstner Group at the MPI, and currently he works as a lab team leader at the Isotope Laboratory at BASF. And with that, I'll let you get started, Raphael. Thanks a lot for joining us to share your work. Thank you very much, Matthew, for the kind introduction and the opportunity to present the main project of my PhD as part of the synthesis workshop. I'm very excited to take you all on a little journey into the world of natural product synthesis today by telling you my personal story of the total synthesis of Provoxantin. Provoxantin is a complex polyketide natural product which was isolated from the unicellular alga species Provoxantrum lima back in 2005. The molecule is decorated with a total of 13 different stereogenic centers, 4 free alcohols and several other sites of oxygenation and unsaturation. It belongs to a whole family of complex polyketide metabolites, all derived from Provoxantrum lima. The most prominent representative is certainly ocodiac acid. As archetypical phosphatase inhibitor, it was crucial for the investigation of this essential enzyme class. The structural similarity of these compounds can hardly be overseen, especially when the core structures of these molecules are compared. From this background, one can speculate that at least parts of the biochemical enzyme machineries for the synthesis of such complex molecules are shared within Porocentrum lima. This is exactly the reason why we decided not to synthesize the structure which is shown in the isolation paper. Since the structure of limaol was undoubtedly determined by total synthesis in 2021 by our own group, we assumed that the enantiomer of the proposed structure, which bears the same core fragment as limaol, more likely represents the true structure of porocentin. In addition to the uncertainty regarding the absolute stereochemistry, previous work by Suzuki and co-workers raised the question of a potential constitutional misassignment in the originally proposed structure. This is why our project began with the critical re-evaluation of all the NMR data published in the isolation paper. Ultimately, our investigations revealed a more plausible regioisomeric structure, which bears the free alcohol on the C17 instead of the originally proposed C16 carbon atom. Finally, the authors of the isolation paper admitted that solely based on NMR spectroscopy it has not been possible to determine the stereochemical relationship between the central and the eastern part of the molecule. This is why we resorted to DFT calculations in order to calculate the most probable structure. In summary, we have used several different analytical tools to come up with two potential structures. To ultimately test our hypothesis of a structural reassignment, we decided to synthesize both the nominal and our revised Porocentin structure. To realize this synthetic endeavor, we needed to come up with an efficient and convergent synthesis plan. We envisaged to cut the molecule in the allylic position of the triene, which would trace us back to sulfone fragment A and, depending on the substitution pattern, epoxy iodide B or C. Based on our experience in previous total synthesis projects, we intended to form the central spirocycle via gold catalysis. Further simplification would be achieved by several functional group modifications and disassembling the enine motif into the corresponding alkyne and vinyl halide fragments D to F. In summary, our retrosynthetic analysis provided us with four different fragments of similar complexity. In the forward sense, the synthesis of our first central fragment started from 2-deoxyribose. As part of a literature-known three-step protocol, the lactol unit of the sugar was ring-opened by additive reaction before the C3 and C5 alcohols were incorporated into a PMP acetal. Finally, the remaining free alcohol was protected as a TBS ether in order to provide the known alpha-beta unsaturated ethyl ester. By treating this compound with ozone, the double bond was oxidatively cleaved to provide the corresponding aldehyde, which was subjected to a Carrera alkylation with TBS protected propargyl alcohol. Subsequent TBF mediated desalylation then provided the alkanal trial in 65% yield over two steps. The triple bond within the molecule was selectively reduced to the set alkene via heterogeneous hydrogenation with Lindless catalyst. 
When this unsaturated trial was reacted with Escherwarren's catalyst, a cationic gold species bearing Buckwald's Chonfors ligand, a Tsuchi type cyclization did take place. This reaction most certainly proceeds via a cyclic transition state where H bonding effects dictate the stereochemical outcome to reveal the desired cis configurated tetrahydropyrin motive. Standard esterification with methyl acrylate then provided the corresponding alpha beta unsaturated ester, which reacted with a Weta perhaps 2 catalyst in boiling toluene in a ring closing metathesis to provide the unsaturated lactone product. The high temperature was necessary in order to disfavor a competing dimerization pathway. Subsequently, the reduction of the double bond was by catalytic heterogeneous hydrogenation with palladium and charcoal. As this reaction proceeded with perfect diastereoselectivity, the lactone could directly be reduced to the corresponding lactol, which was in similarity to before ring opened via the reaction to release the alpha beta unsaturated ester. The ester was reduced to the allylic alcohol before the diol was protected as bis TBS ether. When this compound was treated with dibol and methylene chloride as a non coordinating solvent, the Lewis acidic aluminium tends to coordinate to one of the two acetyl oxygen atoms. Due to its steric bulk, it favors the coordination of the more accessible position. The acetyl now opens, the corresponding oxonium ion will directly be attacked by the hydride residing on the aluminium. After workup, the free alcohol was obtained in 93% yield. Conveniently, this strategy leaves the secondary alcohol as PMB protected ether behind. The primary alcohol handle was oxidized to the aldehyde under certain conditions, which was then subjected to organocatalytic homopropagulation conditions, originally developed by Schaus and co workers. Upon treatment with the chiral binyl catalyst, the alanyl boronate forms a complex which favors the attack from the sterically more accessible side giving rise to the diastereomerically pure homopropagilic alcohol in 68% yield over two steps. Finally, the free alcohol was protected as an acetate and the PMB group was cleaved with DDQ to provide the nominal central fragments in 20 steps longest linear sequence. The synthesis of the eastern fragment solely relied on ligand-based stereoinduction or intrinsic diastereoselectivity in order to be able to tackle both enantiomers, if necessary. It started with a Grisha allylation of pentanol to form the corresponding dienol in good yields and excellent enantioselectivities. The obtained material was then subjected to a Mukayama oxidative cyclization using Pajinkov's cobalt catalyst. The desired trans-configurated tetrahydrofurane was obtained in 72% yield as a single diastereomer. The free alcohol was subsequently oxidized to the carboxylic acid, transformed into the vine rib amide, and treated with isoprene magnesium bromide in order to achieve the formation of the alpha-beta unsaturated ketone. The following Lush reduction proceeded well and led to the isolation of the desired product and excellent yield and selectivity. The observed stereochemistry can be explained with the falcon arn model. The reduction product was protected as naphthol methyl ether. Subsequently, this material was subjected to a platinum canalized bisporylation oxidation sequence. This methodology was developed by Morgan and co-workers and worked very well in our case to provide us with sufficient amounts of the desired dial. Upon addition of a sterically demanding sulfonyl imidazole, the more accessible primary alcohol was selectively transformed into a lever group which under the basic conditions underwent epoxide formation. By treating this epoxide with TMS vinyl magnesium bromide and copper cyanide, the ring open product was formed in overall good yields. It was planned to convert the vinyl TMS group into a vinyl iodide by iodo desalylation. However, treating the free alcohol with NIS led to a complex product mixture. In order to fix this problem, we decided to protect the alcohol intermediately as a TBS ether. In this case, our strategy worked well and we obtained the desired material and good yields after two extra steps. Finally, the naphthol methyl ether was cleaved with DDQ to release our eastern fragment. The guideline for the preparation of our western fragment was straightforward. It commenced with the conversion of propinyl magnesium bromide into the corresponding iodide, which was directly treated with copper iodide and butynol to provide the respective diene as the product of a cutio kotkiewicz coupling. Eselective reduction of the internal alkyne with LAH, followed by stanyl cuprasion and TBS protection, gave us the dienols nanny. 
Treating this compound with the vinyl iodide fragment under conditions from our group, which were particularly developed for stilly couplings with sensitive substrates, gave the cross coupling product. During the reaction, partial isomerization of the triene was observed. However, after oxidation of the thioether to the sulfone, the two isomers could be separated by a flash chromatography to yield the desired western fragment. With our first three fragments in hand, we now paid our attention to the endgame scenario. The anticipated Sonogashira coupling proceeded as expected to provide the precursor for one of our key steps, the gold-catalyzed spiroketalization. We were delighted to see that upon treatment of the E9 with Eschavarin's catalyst, which we have already used in the synthesis of our central fragment, the desired product was formed in very good yields and excellent selectivity. The mechanism probably deserves a few comments. We believe that the piacidic gold catalyst first coordinates to the triple bond to increase its electrophilicity. Next, the free alcohol attacks in a 6 endo cyclization to release the corresponding vanillogous enol ether. Under the acidic conditions, the species is partially protonated at the axocyclic carbon atom, which facilitates the attack of the remaining free alcohol in the system in order to form the spirocycle. As the shown reactions most certainly proceed reversibly, the formation of our desired system, which is stabilized by a double anomeric effect, is thermodynamically favored. The reaction product was then subjected to a sequence in order to release the primary allylic alcohol. This was subjected to a sharpless asymmetric epoxidation to provide the desired epoxide in basically quantitative yields. The free alcohol was then converted into the iodide by standard apple reaction to set the stage for the final fragment coupling. We were very happy to see that the desired product was formed in 79% yield under basic conditions in THF and DMPU. Obviously, the alkylation did not proceed stereoselectively, which was no reason to worry as the sulfone group should directly be removed afterwards. The reductive removal of allylic sulfones usually requires palladium hydride species, which can be formed upon addition of superhydride to a palladium precatalyst. As one of the central tetrahydropyrin rings was still decorated with an acetate, we envisaged the simultaneous removal of this protecting group and the sulfone. When we treated our starting material solely with superhydride at low temperatures, the acetate could be indeed removed cleanly. We were delighted to see that the subsequent addition of the palladium catalyst to this reaction mixture indeed led to the anticipated sulfone removal as well. Following this one-port procedure, the deprotection of the tristyl ether product was achieved with HF pyridine complex in a mixture of pyridine and THF. After two days of reaction time and purification via HPLC, we obtained a small sample of our desired synthetic material. As expected, but still unfortunate, we found that the spectral data of our sample did not match the reported data. In the corresponding carbon NMR, the shift differences in the aliphatic alcohol and ether region were most prominent. In a more visual way, we saw that the biggest shift differences were located around the central tetrahydropyrin system with the potentially misassigned alcohol. Based on these findings, we paid our attention to the synthesis of our revised central fragment. Even though just one alcohol is shifted by a single carbon atom, a completely new strategy was required to target the desired fragment. Therefore, the C4 and C6 alcohols of the glucose were incorporated into a PMP acetal followed by oxidative diol cleavage along the C2-C3 bond. Subsequent addition of propyl magnesium bromide into the aldehyde followed by a propagylic oxidation with manganese dioxide led to the isolation of the propagylic ketone in overall good yields. The stereoselective reduction to set the stereocenter in the propagylic position was achieved by a Noyori transfer hydrogenation. In our case, Will's catalyst turned out to be the best choice in order to provide us with good amounts of the required material with excellent diastereoselectivities. Afterwards, the more activated propagylic position was selectively protected as a TBS ether before the ester sidechain could be installed by EDC esterification. Finally, the alkyne in the southern part of the molecule was converted into the set alkene using standard Lindler conditions. The reaction product was the precursor for yet another very interesting key step of our total synthesis. By treating the shown compound with a large axis of Tabas reagent in a mixture of THF and toluene, a methylination metathesis sequence could be performed in order to forge the central dihydropyrin motif. Such carbonyl olefin metatheses are very challenging and non-trivial. 
In our case, Tabas reagent was actually the only reagent which enabled this transformation. On scale, we could convert 47% of the starting material into the desired compound. The unsaturation in the system was used for setting the required 2,6 stereochemistry of the corresponding tetrahydropyrene. Catalytic hydrogenation with supported platinum and charcoal gave us reproducible yields, whereas the related and more common palladium catalyst led to partial decomposition. With the desired product in hand, we turned our attention to the western end of the molecule. A sequence of in total five steps was necessary to achieve an extension of the carbon chain by two carbon atoms. At this point, we could intercept the strategy which we had already used before for the synthesis of the nominal central fragment. Dibol mediated acetal opening followed by oxidation of the released alcohol to the aldehyde and subsequent Schaus propitulation led to the formation of the desired homopropitulic alcohol. In complete analogy to before, the free alcohol was protected as an acetate and the secondary alcohol bearing the PMB group was deprotected to provide us with reasonable amounts of our revised central fragment. The endgame scenario of revised porocentine was identical with the one we have already discussed for the nominal structure. A total of 9 steps was necessary to provide us with 2.4 mg of the desired molecule. With this material finally in hand, we first measured the optical rotation. Our value was almost identical with the reports in the literature, which meant that if this was the natural product, it would even be the correct enantiomer. When we ultimately obtained the NMR data of our synthetic sample, we were extremely happy to see that we had a perfect match. The structure could be fully assigned and the shift differences never exceeded 0.1 ppm. Based on these findings, we could summarize our work as follows. We have to revise the structure of the marine polyketide natural product team, as the alcohol on the central THP ring does not reside on the C16, but instead on the C17 carbon atom. This fact was undoubtedly proven by total synthesis of both the nominal and the revised natural product. To complete the synthetic endeavor, we started from four different fragments of almost equal complexity, which were forged and merged with the help of cutting-edge synthetic methodology, as well as, yeah, let's be honest, brute force organometallic chemistry. And this brings me to my most important slide, because all the work I have shown you today was not solely done by myself, but by a whole team of brilliant chemists. And I am very happy to acknowledge and thank every one of them here again. Also, I would like to mention my PhD supervisor, Professor Fürstner, as well as the whole research group. The technicians and service departments deserve to be mentioned separately at this point, as their work is very crucial for maintaining a superb research atmosphere at our institute. And finally, I'd like to thank the Max Planck Society for their financial support and you all for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Raphael for a very interesting synthetic story. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.